This is Including You, the new series from Lead at Any Level. Including You features stories from chief diversity officers and other executives who are creating inclusive cultures in their organizations. Our goal is to show what's working in companies just like yours, to give you the tools you need to keep pushing for progress in your own workplace. We want to create belonging and opportunity for everyone, including you. And now here's your host, Amy C. Wanninger. Welcome back to Including You. I'm your host, Amy C. Wanninger, the Inclusion Catalyst. My guest today is Sonia Thompson. She's the inclusive marketing coach, strategist, and consultant behind Thompson Media Group. Thompson Media Group helps brands win customers by delivering inclusive and remarkable experiences that make them feel like they belong. Sonia is self-employed. She's a solopreneur and a company of one, and I'm so glad to have her on the show. Sonia, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I am delighted to have you here because I love talking to other practitioners and business owners and entrepreneurs because it can get lonely out here (laughs) doing this work all on our own. And it's always fun to have people with different perspectives and coming at this work from different angles. And your focus is from a marketing perspective, correct? It is. I... More and more as people are talking about DE, and I think a lot of times what we're hearing, especially these days, are DE and I budgets are being cut or not as much energy and emphasis is being placed on it. And one of the challenges with that is it's not always tied to business results, meaning it's not always tied to how it impacts the consumer and how brands are able to win consumers or lose consumers. And increasingly in the past couple of years in particular, we've seen more and more um, consumers using values um, and values specifically related to diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging as one of the markers that they're using for how they decide which brands that they are going to choose or not. So as more brands are starting to engage in inclusive marketing and making their marketing more inclusive, they're starting to learn that it's not just enough to focus on the marketing aspects of it. It really permeates to the entire brand, the entire culture. Do you have diverse teams? Do you treat those teams? Is it a good environment for them? Are the values that you are have within your company, are they supportive of the community that I am part of and that I belong to? So it's really more of a holistic sort of approach where I end up helping companies. It starts with the meat of the marketing, which I like to see is the sizzle and the dessert, but we often end up going back and getting some vegetables in there, which is the whole inclusive culture aspect of it, because you can't have one without the other. Like you need a well-rounded, very balanced meal to make this thing work. It's interesting that you say this because I feel like companies for so long were able to control the narrative about them. Mm -hmm. They were really able to control the brand. And because of the democratization of media, because we're so exposed Mm -hmm. as individuals with social media and everybody knows everything about everybody, that if companies are putting up a veneer of inclusion, it doesn't take long for that veneer to start chipping away. And for people to see what's really behind it. Would you agree? I totally agree. And more and more companies, excuse me, consumers are starting to go back and dig in and find it. So if a brand is coming out and saying, we support Black lives, we are support diversity, we're 100% into it, like it's part of our values. And then a consumer goes And sometimes it's a simple search. They go on a website and we're like, oh, wait, like you say that you value diversity, but the when I look at the photos of your team or your leadership team, it's not diverse at all from what I can tell. We saw this last year and it happened very recently. We're we're in March right now as recording. So a couple of weeks ago was International Women's Day. Last year on International Women's Day, there were all these companies that were talking about how much they value and support women. And there was this gender equity bot that somebody in the UK created where they're like, oh, you support internet, you support women, but your gender pay gap is is this. And they would put the percentage because in the UK, that's all public information. So they've done that last year and this year. So again, like people are like, not willing to just accept the narrative that you put out. They want to know 
are you really in support of this community before I'm going to give you my attention, before I'm going to come work for you, before I'm going to give you my money as a consumer? I had totally forgotten about the gender pay equity bot. And that was one of my favorite moments on the internet because <laughs> it was like, it was just so beautiful to see all this, this all of this hypocrisy exposed yeah. all the way down the Twitter feed. It was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Let me ask you in terms of market segment, because my guess is, and you can, I'm sure you have the data behind this. My guess is that the younger the consumer is, the more important this is to them. Is that correct? Yeah. So if we look at Gen Z in particular, Gen Z's values and how they're making decisions as it relates to brands is very different from what we've seen from previous generations, partly because Gen Z is the most diverse generation that we've seen yet. I believe they're percent diverse if you look at in the U.S. The census data. So they view diversity. They're more, much more, they've grown up in a more global sort of world. And their expectation is that the brands that they work for and that they buy from are going to share their values. And if we think back to even other generations, whereas Gen Z has that as their core values, Increasingly, as other generations are starting to see that it is possible for different brands to show up for their talent and show up for consumers in a different way, then they're realizing that, oh, I don't just have to accept what's been given to me or accept what has been normalized as being okay in the past. If these brands, these industries, these companies are able to do it, then my expectation is that the, all the brands that I'm serving are going to, that I'm engaging with, are going to do the same thing. So it's definitely very much entrenched with Gen Z, but it's not only them who are having that expect expectation as markets have been changing. I think that's important to know because as folks think about staying relevant, mm -hmm. th this massive shift in what's happening in our economy and the way consumers engage with the companies that they buy goods and services from in all of the ways that we work and all of the ways that we interact with organizations. And those changes in expectations are accelerating just like all other changes accelerating, but it's not going to go away. This isn't a moment in time. This right. is, or it's not it's not a snapshot of what is and it's going to go back. We're talking about something that is here to stay and is only going to intensify as our demographics shift, as our population ages, as young people come more rooted in the workforce and more rooted into the consumer economy. Absolutely. So one of the things that I love to say is inclusive marketing is the future of marketing. And that really applies not only to marketing, it's about inclusion, period. Like it applies for inclusion in the workplace and cultures, et cetera. And one of the examples that I, somebody mentioned that I was like, oh yeah, this is a perfect example of how this relates is they're like inclusive marketing is what digital marketing was 10 years ago. If you think about digital marketing previously, there were these early adopters. There was a lot of companies who like really went into it, but then there was a lot of people who were like, that's not our thing. We're going to be slow. We love doing business this way. But now if you think about it, digital is entrenched in the way everybody does things. Like if you don't have a digital mindset or a digital approach to your business, it's what do you, you're not, you mentioned relevance. It's almost like you're not quite as relevant. And it's going to be the same thing as we think about inclusion because it's rapidly becoming normalized or just the way things are done. And it's the expectation. So if you're not living into it, like you said, you're not going to have that relevance and you're going to be forced to comply. So the idea is don't fight the future, <laughs> embrace it and lean into it. This is important. And the this notion that folks, companies a lot of times want to work on the outside first and not pay as much attention to the inside, but you're saying it doesn't work that way. This is a huge paradigm shift inside companies. Yeah. And that requires a lot of change management, a lot of change readiness, a lot of internal messaging and reinforcement and the changing of policies and standards and approaches and reward systems and all sorts of things. What are some of the changes with your clients that they that maybe come as a surprise to them or that they need to be careful about managing as they move toward a more inclusive brand strategy? I think the biggest thing that people 
encounter that they are surprised that they have to do is once the company decides whoever's in leadership that this is what we're going to do, this is the direction that we're going. I think that sometimes they're surprised when they receive resistance. They they think that everybody's just going to be on board with it. And often enough, you can't just expect that, if, especially if you're leaning into the moral imperative for inclusion, you can't necessarily expect that everyone is just going to come along with you. Yes, you might work on the culture and you say that, oh, everybody who works here shares the same values, but there are so many things in society and life that we cannot find agreement on so that people are going to differ. But what I often recommend is that it's very much important to always tie these conversations to the business, because then it's not up to you and your personal values or your personal politics or whatever. It doesn't become a political thing. It doesn't become like this hot button thing that that forces people to argue and puts them in an opposite ends of the room, it becomes, this is what our business needs. This is what our business needs to grow. And we're all here to run and grow a business and, and support the people that we're serving. And if we can agree that these engaging in the way we show up and work in this manner is better for the business, then that is something that is harder for people to, it it takes the emotion out of it for a lot of people and it enables them to get on board because it's easy for them to connect the dots without forcing them to challenge their belief system, so to speak, if they have some strong feelings about certain things for one way or another. And it makes them feel less defensive sometimes about any particular narrative that might put them in an uncomfortable position about it. So if you think about it from how can we tie this to this will help us serve our customers better. And then this is how we're going to operate moving forward. And then you tie it to your company's values and everyone's individual um, roles and responsibilities then it becomes something that's not optional. It's because this is something that we've established. This is how we're going to show up. This is the way we work because this is what our business needs. Then it becomes not just the job of one or a few people in the company. It becomes something that is every individual who is on the team, your contractors, et cetera. It becomes something that they can connect to and figure out how can, how do I show up in a way that I can support this overall business strategy or this business objective in my day-to-day work. And that is what will help create that lasting change versus, Hey, this is something that feels like it's extra. And we're going to have to cut the budgets because we got to focus on how we can grow or how we can save. This is actually tying it to how your business will achieve its goals. I think it's important to note here that companies may experience different turnover once they get intentional about inclusion being part of their value system. Yes. And I've had people in organizations say, we don't want to lose anybody because we're focused on this. And they're surprised when I say, you're already losing people because you're not focused on this. Absolutely. And we have to think about, do we want individuals in our organization who are not aligned to our mission or not. And I think that's an important piece, right? You have to be willing to let go of things that you can't control, things that you can't change, um, people that don't want to get on board, people that will sabotage. And that's an uncomfortable thing for people to discuss in a meeting, right? When they're talking about strategy. And I think that there's a number of examples of companies who have had to let go people who were top talent, high performers, et cetera, because they didn't live into their values. And it's important to know that, like you said, you have to count the cost. Like that feels like a very visible, difficult cost that they don't want to lose, but they have no idea how many people have decided not to work with your company because you haven't made it a priority. How many people have left your company? They gave a different reason, but that was really at the heart of it. How many customers have chosen not to buy from you because it hasn't been something that you focus on? You've already are losing a lot that you haven't been able to quantify because you didn't realize that was such an issue. And I think that people are thinking so much about what they might lose that's in front of them and not really thinking about what they have to gain. 
Absolutely. Now you do a lot of coaching work Mm -hmm. with executives that, that work for your client companies as well and other leaders. What are some of the common sticking points that you hear from them? For them, it's often, they're not, there's a couple of things. One, as they're starting to get on board, they're trying to figure out how to enroll their team. And for me and how I've been coaching them through it, it's really connecting it to the business results. Then it's been more about how do we get comfortable talking about diversity and inclusion? And because if it's tied to the business, then it's something that needs to be an ongoing part of the conversation. And I think that a lot of people have shied away from a lot of diversity-based conversations at work because they felt like they were more political in nature. But whenever you're looking at it in the context of the business, you have to have these discussions. And they it's and the only way people are going to get more comfortable in having them is by having them more. So it's more so about how do you connect the dots for the people in the business and help them see that this is what we need to do and how can you support them and having those conversations and getting to the point to where they're more comfortable with it. And they've been starting to see that over time, you know what, we just had this conversation and it wasn't uncomfortable a year ago. We wouldn't have been able to do this. And that's been helpful. And then one other big thing has been figuring out how to measure the right things. So in one example is a lot of times it's we want to hire a diverse team. So we're going to focus on who we interview and the percentages of the people that we're interviewing to help us get to the right team. Whereas ultimately my coaching for them is focus on hiring who you need. It's less about the interview process and the pipeline that you're building. It's more about these are the holes that we have in our team. Here's the things that we need. And here's what we, the positions or the types of experiences, the types of identities that we need to put on our team so that we can better serve the people that we're focusing on, on our, our end consumer. And whenever we focus it more so on the end result versus and actually what you need to do to be successful versus like this metric is like a leading indicator of what might get us to this point. Then whenever you're changing on the outcome versus some of the inputs, it helps you get better outcomes and better results over time. So just helping them figure out where they should be focusing their energy and what they should be measuring has been a big mindset shift that has helped them not feel like they're doing a lot of work, but not getting the results that they're looking for, but actually get the results that they're looking for. Yeah. And that can be tricky because people don't know how to have those conversations either about missing perspectives on the team. And sometimes they don't, they aren't even aware they're missing perspectives. And the way I like to explain this, I used to be a big baseball fan growing up and we loved the Mets. Those that was our team. But as we would watch as specifically as the teams would get to the playoffs leading up to the off season, and then all the changes that they would make right after it, the teams were always making changes to ensure that they had the best team possible to help them win the championship to win the world series. So what would they do? Oh, we've got a number of right-handed pitchers. Now we need to make sure we've got left-handed pitchers. We've got sluggers. We need contact hitters. We need people who can steal bases. We need people who can bunt. We need people who can throw and throw people out. Like we need all these different skills and no one ever balks at teams working to have the right mix and the right diversity of talent on their team for a sports team, because they understand that We can't have everybody who's got all the same strength. We're not going to be the balanced team. But whenever it comes time to talking about diversity in the context of people and work, people just get all jammed up and they're not really sure. It feels uncomfortable to talk about. It feels taboo to talk about. Like we shouldn't be doing it. We can't talk about people. But diversity is very commonly accepted as okay and welcomed in so many other arenas and formats. And we need to be able to embrace doing it in the same way for our teams because it's how we're going to grow. It's how we're going to achieve our goals. And it's not about just an uncomfortable conversation that we can't have because it feels too taboo to have. We have to get used to making decisions and making sure that we build the team that we need that's going to help us achieve those results. And whenever we're looking at it holistically that way, 
it helps you better evaluate your team based upon what those needs are. So those holes that you mentioned, you're able to think about it in a different way. When you were talking about the baseball team, it reminded me of, I'm a a Gallup certified strengths coach and I do strengths coaching with teams and individuals. And I really got the certification not to coach, but to teach, uh, right. To train on the strengths. And one of the fundamental principles of that program is that individuals need to be, need to be working in their zone of genius. Mm -hmm. Teams need to be well-rounded. Yes. But individuals don't. And I think it's so important for teams, for people who lead teams to be able to say, this is the knowledge, the skills, the capabilities, the experience and the perspectives that we need to have represented on this team. One person doesn't have to come with all of it, but we need to make sure that we don't have, we don't have gaps. And it's okay to say, and and you you have to name the gaps. And I think that there are some gaps that people are comfortable naming and others that they're not. I've been working with a client who is working on reaching Spanish speakers. So what do they need to do? They needed to hire bilingual talent. They needed that person to be bilingual. They needed a certain number of people to be bilingual so that they can serve a growing Spanish speaking customer base. There was no sort of weirdness, like hesitancy to say we need a bilingual talent, we need bilingual talent, but it might feel weird for someone to say we need more women or we need more people from Gen Z or you know what we don't have anybody black on our team and we this and that's a miss because we definitely have black consumers or actually we under index on black consumers whereas they equally have the problem that our business solves i think that you have to look at not just your team but you have to look at the customers that you're serving and see are your customers representative of the people who have the problem that you're solving. And if they are, then okay, yeah, you probably are doing a great job. But if they're not, like maybe you're over-indexing or under-indexing on certain people, you have to look at why and your team and how you show up as a team and having the identities that are representative of the customer you're serving. That's one of the things that can help you correct that. Yes. And (laughs) the people that are missing from your customer base represent new markets you can go after. Absolutely. And it's hard to go after those customers if you don't understand them. Absolutely. If you don't speak their language, literally or (laughs) figuratively, if you don't have people inside your organization that look like the people outside of your organization that you're marketing to. Absolutely. So many companies get themselves in a bit of trouble because they didn't understand that. And they put something in a print ad, for example, that wildly offensive, right? made it very clear that there was not a single black decision maker anywhere in their marketing process. Absolutely. There was this one ad that I saw outside a coffee shop years ago. It said proudly gentrifying since 2014. And they clearly didn't know that gentrification is a very touchy topic and that the harm that a lot of gentrification causes on different communities, particularly people from um, marginalized communities. And it was clear that they didn't have anybody on their team that had that perspective or that lived experience to let them know that this isn't something that you want to say that you're proud about and you're alienating how many people in your community that maybe you could have, they could have been customers for you. But it's right. You said like, you have to have a team that is representative of the people that you want to serve, because that will help you assist you in developing the right degree of intimacy that you need to effectively serve a community, especially if you're not a part of that community yourself. Yes. The, I've talked to several people that have visited that coffee shop (laughs) and it's funny because they didn't, they did not understand and a, a slightly different message could have carried a much different meaning. Something to the effect of in your community since whatever year. Probably serving this community. <laughs> and, and then people would feel a sense of pride that they're supporting a local business. Yes. Or a small business or a homegrown business as opposed to basically funding an occupying force in the community. Yes. Just such a, a different way of thinking about it. But it's so important to know 
your audience. Absolutely. And not one avatar in your audience, but all of the real people that live there. Absolutely. The core of what it is whenever I'm talking about this, um, coaching is all about belonging. We need to be able to make the people that we're serving, whether that's the customers, whether it's your internal team, the people that we're serving need to feel like they belong with us. Whenever they feel like they belong, attention, adoration, loyalty, they're gladly give it to you. But when they don't feel like they belong, they're going to go off in search of another option that does make them feel that way. And a sign that said that like that gentrification sign, oh, I don't, somebody's going to get that signal. I don't belong here. And they're going to keep walking another, just another simple signal or action or whatever it is that you're doing can go a long way towards making people feel seen, cared for, and like they belong. And that will, I think it will just, I don't think that people recognize the benefit and the value that goes whenever you take the time to make someone feel that way. And it goes a long way towards in terms of not you having to do all the hefty lifting every day to win new customers, to retain the talent that you have. Um, And it it saves the business a lot of time, energy, and resources. Because then you tap into this word of mouth thing that's free. Yes. Where somebody says, I use that service, or I went to that coffee shop, or I bought their product and it was great. Yeah. And I loved it. And who are they talking to? They're probably talking to people who look just like them mm-hmm. when they say it. Absolutely. And because that's who we go home to. And in our community, just the way our society is structured, we tend to stick in groups and in communities and around people that look like us and have similar backgrounds. And so the way to build a market in a community is to start winning people over and get them talking. Absolutely. And the more people that you include, the more, and especially whenever you're seeing people and making people who are traditionally underrepresented and underserved, those are the only ones who are going to do more talking because they're so used to be ignored. So I remember I follow a gluten-free diet for health reasons. And I also love cupcakes. Like I've always loved cupcakes. And that was a big blow for me that for a long time, once I went gluten-free, I didn't have any, didn't have cupcakes. And oftentimes gluten-free cupcakes are just they taste gluten-free. So I remember whenever I went to Sprinkles Bakery, they have a branch in Tampa near where I live. And they had, I heard about this cupcake ATM machine. And so I went with uh, some friends and we went down there and I was going thinking that I would just watch them get the ATM out of the cup, the cupcake out of the ATM machine, because I'm like, I didn't think they were going to have gluten-free, but they had gluten-free cupcakes. They had vegan cupcakes because one of the girls in the group was vegan and we all got to experience it. And then the cupcakes were delicious. So not only was it this wonderful experience, but they had taken the time to consider people with various dietary restrictions or preferences. I went and shouted from the rooftops to everyone that I could think to tell about this bakery and this cupcake ATM machine. And the fact that they had these gluten-free red velvet cupcakes that were delicious. Like they taste like the real thing. And over the years, like I've taken so many people to Sprinkles. Every time I see Sprinkles, I feel like I have to buy from them. I've talked about it on social media. I've written articles about them, made videos. About I've talked about them. Why? Because there are plenty of cupcakes that I've had in my life, but because that one in particular took the time to meet my needs as someone, as a gluten-free person, someone who's often ignored, there's often times where I don't get the dessert at all. And I rewarded them with not only my loyalty, but I cannot shut up about them. I talk about them constantly. And that's often what happens whenever brands are very intentional about serving people that most others ignore. We just are compelled to tell others about it. I absolutely love it. I love all of the free marketing you just did for Sprinkles Cupcakes. (laughs) I hope they hire you for their marketing team. (laughs) I would gladly do it. They can pay me in cupcake (laughs) dogs. We'll see you over there with cupcake wrappers everywhere behind you. You'd be like, I'm good. Yes. (laughs) So yeah, thank you so much for this conversation, for sharing your expertise and insights with us. And I want to ask you before we go, I want to make sure I ask, who are your target clients? Who do you work with most often? Who do you love working with? And how can people reach you if they need your help? 
So I often work for, I do a lot of consulting with big brands and coaching with medium-sized brands, smaller brands, who basically the... You're my ideal client if you are committed to wanting to make more people feel like they belong. So depending upon where you are, we I use the same framework to help you become more of an inclusive brand. And I'm excited to be able to chat and support more brands and helping more people feel like they belong. You can find me, I have a podcast, Inclusion and Marketing. You can find me on social at Sonia E. Thompson or on my website, inclusivemarketing.co. Thank you so much. We'll make sure to put all those links in the show notes so it will be easy to find you. And if you see Sonia out, drag her over to a cupcake ATM and yes. grab her a gluten-free cupcake. And I'm betting she'll be your best friend for life. I will. Absolutely. <laughs> it was so great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, follow Lead at any level on LinkedIn and YouTube. Then join us for Including You video simulcast every Thursday at noon Eastern. Including You can also be enjoyed each week as part of the Living Corporate Audio Podcast Series, available on all major podcast platforms. Learn more at living-corporate.com. Including You is brought to you in part by Lead at Any Level, a boutique training and consulting firm improving employee engagement and retention for companies that promote from within. Lead at Any Level. Leaders can be anywhere and should be everywhere. Learn more at leadatanylevel.com. Lead at Any Level and its logo are registered trademarks of Lead at Any Level LLC. The views and opinions of guests on our show do not necessarily reflect the positions of Lead at Any Level, Living Corporate, or the sponsors of Including You. That's it for this week's episode of Including You. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to leave us a review and let us know what you thought. Be sure to join us next week when my guest will be Candace Bristow from Expel.